Hi guys. So in this video, I will be discussing about my Vipro round one experience. So what all things have been asked to me as a six plus years of experience in Java developer field. So this uh, interview questions is not only for six plus, it is helpful for four plus, five plus, till seven to eight years of experience as well. Because there are a lot of questions which is most commonly asked. So let's directly jump onto the uh, PPT and we'll show you like what all type of question has been asked. I hope you can see my screen now. So this is the Vipro interview experience round one. So let's jump back to the questions. So first question is the details about the project. So they were grilling more on like what all projects have you worked upon? What all tech stacks have you used? And uh, how have you implemented your tech stacks like microservices? So what all things you have implemented in your microservices? If you are using REST API, then what all things have you implemented? How have you communicated like one API to another API? So those all things they were asking. And have you made use of any, any messaging system or not like RabbitMQ or Kafka? Those things also they were asking. Okay. So you should be knowing about your projects properly. Okay, then only you will be able to answer each and every one of them. Yeah, so these were the details about the projects that has been asked to me. Okay, so you should be knowing your project very well. Like what all things have you done? Like how have you handled millions of records coming onto your endpoint? So those things, peculiar type of question you should be knowing in, uh, in advance. Okay, next question. So this was the, my next question that was asked to me. Like if any of my microservices down, then after deployment, how will you resolve it? So let's suppose you have created, you have made some changes in your microservice and you have deployed it. Then after deployment, there can be a chance like that uh, microservice is failing. Okay, it's not working anymore. Then what all steps you will, you need to take at that point of time so that you will work on that microservice to fix it. So here are the software de deployment best practices that you need to follow. First is like deployment automation will get started. Then because build process will be starting and then automatically deployment process, you it will get started. Then uh, there is a deployment checklist, like what all things you, uh, you uh, needs to needs to follow before it, it goes for deployment. So those checklists you have to maintain. Then you need to have that backup and rollback strategies so that uh, there is any transaction happening with database. So you should have that mechanism maintained in your code such that all changes gets rolled back. Then there's continu continuous integration. So whatever changes you are doing, okay, whatever changes you are doing, so whenever you are committing, so automatically it will get integrated with the existing code base. So that is continuous integration. Then continuous delivery, okay. Then proper communication needs to be happening so that you can see like, uh, whatever changes is being done and whatever was there before is it matching or not and you should communicate the same to your team lead or to the team channel okay there should be a helpful deployment tools that you need to uh, work upon so that you need to see like your deployment is happening properly or not so these are the software deployment best practices and these are the things you need to perform if your service is down after deployment first is you have to make use of monitoring tools okay so you have to make use of monitoring tools and check for immediate assessment like what all things you need to perform now so that you uh, this uh, some small small changes can be monitored quickly okay so there should be monitoring tools available with you for immediate assessment second is like you need to know like what all things have been uh, changed okay in the database so you, so there can be a chance like there's some database issue okay some duplicate data are present. So you need to roll back the changes if required. So in that case, uh, you need to have add the transaction annotation with rollback for equal to exception dot class. Similar to that, you need to add that rollback mechanism in your code in such a way that if there is any issue coming with DB save or update or any TML operation, then it should get rolled back automatically. Okay. That is happening or not that you have to check in the code. Then you have to diagnose the issue. Okay. Whenever your issue is uh, coming, so we have to check first, go up, go into the Jenkins log. Okay go into the deployment logs and see like what what exception exactly is coming. From there, you will get the idea, like what type of issue is there. Then you need to see like where, where you need to see the script part in the Jenkins, or you need to see the deployment script, or you need to see need to see the code part. From there, you will get the idea. Then you will start diagnosing the issue by looking the deployment logs, okay? Then we have to in investigate any potential cause, like what are the potential issues happening because of which it is failing. Okay, so you need to see like, is there any code changes you are doing? And due to is is it due to recent code changes because of which this uh, dependency is 
this deployment is failing okay and then after deployment service is failing so anything is failing so you need to see that what is the potential cause for that okay is there any dependency issue or not so those things we have to monitor then you have to implement fixes okay so you have to observe like is there any hot fix required hot fix means uh, some small changes if you do it will start working so start applying hot fix okay if it is like very urgent and production issue came and your microservice is down after deployment then in that scenario this is very much helpful like uh, you you might be getting information from your team lead or from your team members as well like apply hot fix and see if it is getting resolved or not okay and if there is any adjustment required in the configuration level okay so that also you can see like in properties file or in dev properties or other properties file, if there is any configuration that is required at a Jenkins level or at a code level, you can see that and you can make adjustment over there. And then after resolution, you can monitor continuously, like what was the root cause analysis because of which the microservice failed. And you have to make sure that those things should not repeat again. So you have to make a note of it and you have to create a service that will monitor those changes. Okay. So root cause analysis is very important. Then next question is, how to manage millions of records hitting your endpoint, okay? So there can be a chance like lots of data is coming as a request. In uh, Amazon, uh, if you can see in a great Indian festival sale, so in that point of time, if you see, there will be heavy loading. There are a lot of people coming onto your uh, Amazon endpoint and people are uh, buying a lot of products. So URL is one, a lot of people are hitting your endpoint. So what will happen in that scenario? Will your endpoint be able to manage that Okay, will your microservice be able to manage that transaction at such a high level at millions of records are getting transacted at that particular moment of time? So what can you do in that scenario? There are a lot of things you can maintain. Okay, You can create a scalable microservice. You can create a distributed architecture, distributed system architecture. Okay, You can make use of rate limiter so that you can uh, restrict only particular people only particular set of people and if it is crossing that then you, uh, they will then you will be telling them like there's a limit has been reached okay so rate limiter also you should know like how you can implement that rate limiter in your code okay so these are the few things that we have to understand first is we have to make a scalable architecture model okay so you have to make use of a proper load balancer so that uh, that microservice will have multiple instances so that if one of the instances gets down then other microservice will be eligible for doing the further transaction and load gets distributed uh, across all the instances, okay? There is auto-scaling. There is certain thing called as upscaling and there is certain thing called as downscaling. So if there is a lot of load coming, millions of records are coming, then you need to what? You need to upscale it at that point of time. And then after that Great Indian Festival sale has uh, passed away, like three, four days, then after that, that much uh, uh, load will not come into your endpoint. So in that scenario, you should know that you should down, downscale it, okay? So upscale and downscale should happen automatically. So auto-scaling feature needs to be implemented in your code. That is important. That is optimizing your data handling. Okay. So in database section, that also you need to optimize. Yeah, how can you optimize data handling? So you can make use of indexing. Okay. With the help of indexing, it improves the performance. Okay. Speed gets improved because millions of records, it needs to get saved in the DB as well, right? So that database management should also be handled. And caching mechanism should also be there. Like if, uh, uh, let's suppose, out of 1 million people, who those who are hitting your endpoint, and out of that 40% people are uh, making use of the same product. Okay, They are buying the same product. So for those 40% people, it should not hit the database again and again, again and again. So proper caching mechanism needs to be implemented. So for example, you can implement Redis cache. So if you implement that the kind of cache mechanism, then what will happen? Uh, it will not hit endpoint. One time if it hits, it will understand and it will store the data in the cache. Okay. So multiple times it will check that if that data is being called again and again, then it will automatically understand with uh, cacheable annotation and those things you have to implement. And uh, after that, it will check like this uh, data is being uh, uh, fetched frequently. So it will take it from the cache. It will not hit the database again and again. So it improves the performance drastically. Okay. Then the concurrency and rate limiting feature needs to be implemented as well. Like you should have the async feature, like multi-threading feature needs to be implemented in such a way that uh, there should be a rabbit MQ or Kafka or async mechanism so that you, people will get a response at that point of time. And then the data uh, saving into database or those things, those things are not required by the user as of now. So those things can happen in the background. And rather than that, after that, what user actually wants at that point of time 
in a faster way that thing you can display to the user and this thing you can put it in a sync mechanism so that it will run parallelly in the background and data will get saved in db or updated in db those things can go parallelly and rate limiting i already told you there should be a limiter rate limiter which can block after a certain set of users getting access to, to the particular endpoint okay then there should be monitoring and alert, alert tool you can make use of cloud trail or cloud watch okay to monitor the alert in aws and optimization technique also you can use like how to optimize your queries okay how can you optimize your uh, logics in such a way that it uh, returns the response faster so those things also you can see in your code and uh, security and uh, reliability should be maintained you, your rest api should be reliable so that other clients can rely on your endpoint like if a lot of users are hitting your endpoint then it's, it should get the response it's not like a microservice is failing so those things should not occur so reliability should be there and should be highly available availability also should be high and a proper security mechanism needs to be implemented as well like you can implement spring boot security and then you can implement jwt authentication and, and you can create a configuration classes and enable web security configuration adapter so those things you can do and you can implement the security in your project okay so authentication and authorization, that part is very much important, okay? So if you comment it down, I will explain you in depth, like how to implement JWT authentication, how it works internally, those things I can explain. Next question that was asked is, which all data structures have you used in your project? So this is very common question that most of the service-based companies will ask you, like they will try to know, like what all question they will ask, have you implemented that thing in your project or not? So most of the people have implemented list, queues, uh, set, map these things so they will ask question based on that only okay then uh, this question was asked like in which scenario time complexity is more in case of hash map so you know right in hash map there is insertion there is fetch operation there is uh, delete operation remove operation a lot of things are there so uh, in general insertion and fetching operation is of one time complexity okay but in case of worst case scenario both will have o of n time complexity where whether it's insertion or whether it's fetching okay so these things we have to understand because it's uh we are making use of linked list and if uh, data is there at last node and you have you want to fetch that node data which is present at last node of the linked list okay so it will take o of n time complexity because it needs to go through all the nodes okay so uh, that is the thing like worst case scenario for fetching as well as for insertion is o of n so that thing you have to explain then what changes came in hash map after java 8 so uh, it, it has been like a, there was a uh, they, uh, actually prior to this prior to Java, all nodes were getting stored in the form of linked list. Okay, where the next nodes address is getting stored in the previous nodes next. So that like that, they were all nodes were getting connected. But after Java eight, because that time the time complexity is off and in worst case, but we need to reduce it. So Java people has made a threshold like as soon as the node count reaches a threshold. Then after that, it will get converted into a red black tree. Okay. And red black tree has a time complexity. Any tree data structure has a time complexity of O of log n. Okay. So and, and like this, the time complexity reduces drastically. And once it reaches the threshold, then actually rehashing occurs and all the data which were there at the particular index, it gets it gets uh, situated at another bucket. Okay. So rehashing occurs. So that is also having time complexity of O of n. Okay, so there are two things, hash collision and rehashing. So you should be clear on that. Then what all features are implemented in Java 8? So what all things you have implemented, you can tell. Not that what all things are there in Java 8, but what all things you have implemented in, in your project in Java 8, that thing you have to explain it to the interviewer. Like you might have made use of optional class for storing, uh, for checking the empty scenario for null point exception to resolve, or you have made use of completable future, or you have made use of stream API, or you have made use of Lambda function, functional interface, those things you can tell. You, you don't tell those things which you haven't implemented. Like you haven't implemented date time API, but you are telling that date time API is there. Then they can ask questions on you. So you should be prepared on that as well, okay? So next question is, this question was asked like, what's the difference between map and flat map, okay? So this is also I have seen like it's most commonly asked question difference between map and flat map. And in one of the interview experience, I've already explained to you what's the difference with proper code and all. So I will not go in depth in this. So flat map is basically for flattening purpose. So if it is like containing list of list of data, so for flattening purpose so that it, in one list only it contains all the data it is for uh, flat map is used. Okay. So these are the things and this uh, question was asked to me, but which we need to solve it using flat map. 
like I'm having map of string and list of string. So basically I'm having string data like 001002 and list of string is there, which contains name and some ID, employee ID. So those things are stored in a map. So basically here I have, I, the interviewer asked me to flatten the list and we have to do the uppercase for these names. Okay, so uh, you do it by your own. Okay, I will not tell the solution as of now. You do it, do it by your own and put it in a comment box, like what, what uh, answer you got. And then if you want me to uh, tell the answer, I will put it in the comment box. Okay, so first you try it by your own. Okay, because that will create a practice for you. Because if you mug it up and tell them, they can modify the question a little bit, then it will be stuck over there. So try it by your own. Okay. Next was how to create your own custom annotation. So this is also important question. How to create a custom annotation. So you have to follow certain steps for creating your annotation, custom annotation. Like you have to create an interface, then you have to initialize certain fields in that. So three steps are there more or less. So these are the three steps that we have to follow. First, we have to define the annotation. Okay. So you, have, you can make use of a public address interface, my custom annotation. Then you can give the string value default value you can give over here. So if it is called, then this default value will be returned back. Okay. Then we are giving detention annotation at the runtime, the data should get retained for that. And we are giving target annotation element type dot method. Okay. So we can change it based upon field and type. Then second step is use the annotation. We have defined the annotation. Now we have to use the annotation. So here you can see the, there is an interface. Okay. My custom annotation. So now here you can see I am using it at the rate my custom annotation and we are giving the value as custom value. Okay. So if you don't give, if you don't give this custom value, it will make use of default value. So if you don't want to use default value, uh, give the assign the value as custom value. And then you can implement your method and, and you can give your method implementation. Let's suppose for that annotation, you need to uh, uh, have some business logic so you can implement that. Okay. And third step is you have to access the annotation. Okay. So how will you access the annotation? So with the help of reflection, you can access the annotation. Okay. So here you can see I'm using my class, this class dot class dot get method. I'm uh, calling this get method and I'm passing this my method. Okay. And then you are using a get annotation method. And we are passing this my custom annotation dot class. So we are getting that annotation okay, for that class. And this my custom annotation data is being returned back and stored it in annotation reference. So my custom annotation is the interface and then data is being stored in the interface reference. And if it is getting checked, like if it is not null, then we will get the data as annotation dot value. So whatever value is being set here, okay, in the my method implementation, that value you can fetch it from here. So like that, you can implement your own annotation. Okay. I hope you got the clarity on this. So you need to practice it a bit by your own. Okay. Try to do some research, try to practice it. If you want to, if you want me to create a dedicated video on this, then also I will create it. Okay. So just comment it below, like you want dedicated video on this, then I will create it on this as well. Now, next question was this. Create your own custom compile time exception and custom runtime exception. Okay. So this was the question that was asked to me. So you have heard of common question like create your own custom exception that you can make it right. Class custom exception, any name you can give an extends exception class, create constructor and give the message. That was the normal way an extends exception class. Yeah. So this is the normal way of creating your own custom exception. But if they tell you to create your own checked and unchecked exception, then what will you do with that scenario? For compile time exception, you can directly extend exception class and you can uh, create constructor and give the message. For runtime exception, you have to extend the runtime exception class. That is unchecked exception, which is checked at runtime. Okay. So for that, there is a certain exception class given in the hierarchy, which is runtime exception. You extend that runtime exception and it will make sure that class is extending all the methods and features from the runtime exception, not compile time exception. So that thing you have to make sure. And there is nothing called compile time exception. So we have to extend exception class only for compile time exception. So we hope you got the clarity on this. Next question was this. Have you used any multi-threading mechanism? Okay. Like futures, completable future, asyncs. So if you have made use of, you can tell like, yes, I've made use of completable future. Like this, we send, uh, we send the data, we get the data. Those things you can explain. Asynchronous programming is there. And I have made use of iterate async. Okay. In one of the project for HSBC, I have made use of iterate async. So it's very good. Actually, if you uh, don't want that method to get uh, returned that that particular methods data in the response in the response video, okay, in the JSON format, then 
you can make use of at that async so that let's suppose some db operation is happening and there are a lot of data and it is taking time then the response will take a lot of time to come right then you can put at the async over that method so that it will process in the background and you will get your response like 200 okay before all. okay so that way you can use that direct async and future you know right if you want to get the data okay after a certain period of time then you can make use of future so this is the thing if you have made use of you can explain otherwise you can tell like i have it Make use of it, but you should know theoretically. They can ex they can ask you like, do you know something about this or not? You should have basic knowledge on this at least. Okay. Next question was asked to me like this: Why we move to Spring Boot? We were having Spring, right? Spring, Spring MVC. Why we move to Spring Boot then? So uh, you should know three four points on this. Okay, so there are a lot of points like auto configuration feature is there. Then rapid application development is there. Then there is a uh, embedded Tomcat which is already embedded within Spring Boot, which was not there. We have to uh, make changes in the standalone.sh file, if you remember, in case of Spring. And we have to do a lot of configuration. So in Spring Boot, we don't need to do that much configuration. We just have to focus on our business logic and rest configuration part, Spring Boot will take care of themselves. Basic configuration we need to give, rest all things, Spring Boot will take care of it. So there are a lot of advantages of Spring Boot over Spring so that you can explain. Second, the next was questions on deployment. What all deployment process you have followed in your project? So that thing you can express. Like if you have made use of uh, PCF for deployment or if you have made use of harness for deployment, what all things have you done there? Okay, how have you done the deployment? Those things you can explain. So next question was, what plugin have you used for code coverage or sonar check? So pause this video for two, two seconds and try to think. Okay, so this was a very good question. So for code coverage, and uh, sonar check we can make use of sonar cube okay there is a plugin called sonar cube if we integrate it in our ide like eclipse or spring tool suit or intellij ide if you are integrating that sonar cube then you can see like how much if you run your project with a uh, code coverage uh, j unit code coverage then what you can see like how many code you covered how much part of the code is covered with green and red sign you can see and then you can see like why are all sonar scans are failing okay it will also scan the sonar part. So sonar cube is the plugin that we have to install. Then next question was how to change the environment name where API is going to get deployed. Okay. So there actually we are writing script for that. So we are writing Jenkins file and there we are writing the script and there actually we are putting the condition. Like if it the uh, branch name is this and if the environment name is main or uh, dev or any environment name then set this particular environment like env dot name equal to this like that you have to write a script in jenkins file so if you do like this it will uh, go internally and it will run all those test cases and it will go through that uh, lines and then it will set the data and from ui side there is an option to set it like you can choose your feature branch where you want to which branch you want to get deployed and then you can choose the environment as well so if you choose that and click on that process deploy process then it will go through that code jenkins file code and that and it will go for further deployment process so this is the whole process you can do some research on it if you uh, want dedicated video on this and you can tell me as well so this was asked like what is spring profiling so this is a common question like spring profiling what all things are there so we have to define in properties file like spring dot profiles dot active which profile you want to get activated there are a lot of profiles so particular to that profile you can create your own properties class like you can create spring profile uh, space dev dot properties spring profile dot space uh, sit dot properties or uat dot properties you can create your properties file and based upon that you can give up in configuration class like which particular profile you want to activate so you can give spring profiles spring dot profiles dot active equal to dev so dev profile will get activated like that we can give the profiling next question was how jenkins understand where to deploy change and in which region so jenkins understand through uh, script okay so whenever you are providing the environment or feature branch or uh, those things so it will go through our code the jenkins code and whatever script we have written and then it will decide whatever things you have passed in the UI and then based on upon the conditions given in the script, it will go and deploy in that particular environment. Okay. So this is the particular script that we can follow. So these are the script. If you have gone through some of the uh, scripting part in the build and deployment process, you will get to see code similar to this only where the pipeline will be there. Then agent, if there is any then environment, 
we have to give the region then there are multiple stages like if it is in build stage then we have to show building like that if it is in deploy stage then within that there is a script written like if branch name is main then this is the region name if branch name is developed then region is the us east group okay so like that you can create your own custom script okay next question was what was the benefit what are the benefits of microservices or monolithic application it's a very common question okay we don't have to tell again and again this uh, microservice is more scalable okay it has uh, a lot of design pattern we can implement so uh, there can be distributed transaction with proper uh, rollback mechanism and it it is like highly available reliable and secured okay it is faster so there are a lot of uh, advantages you can go through it next comes this how microservice interact with each other and what if, if one microservice fails? So if, uh, microservices are interacting with each other with the help of two ways. First is synchronous way and another is asynchronous way. Synchronous way is with the help of REST template. You have to auto wire REST template class and then you have to call exchange method and you have to pass the URI and the request DTO which that particular microservice is accepting. And then you have to fetch the data, get the body, get the status and then based on that you have to write the further business logic. And for async, which is asynchronous communication for that you can make use of rabbit fq kafka okay so in that there will be like a broker topic within that topic you will store the message and then there will be producer consumer so those all things are there so with the help of that with the you can transfer the message okay and make the microservices communicate with each other next question was kafka so they will ask in details about kafka like what all things are there how consumer groups work with each other. Let's suppose if uh, Kafka services gets down, then how will you handle that? These type of questions will come. So here is coming the question for you. So this is a very important question. Okay. So you have implemented your circuit breaker design pattern. And let's suppose you have given retry attempts as three. After three retry attempts, it will give the failure message like this microservice is down. But let's suppose after first retry attempt, it, it gives success. Okay, it returns 200 response and we are getting the data from there, that microservice. And that data is being posted in a queue in a particular topic. Okay, and then while subscriber is listening to that topic went down, okay, or cluster or Kafka service went down somehow, then how will you handle this scenario? So for that, you need to know about the scaling part. How will you auto scale? Okay, like vertical scaling, horizontal scaling, is there upscaling, downscaling, is there? Okay, so if those services are not being used, so you can downscale it. So if all the services will be used, then you can upscale it. So those things you just need to know. So these are the things you can make use of consumer group rebalancing. You can use of circuit breaker design pattern on consumer side as well, not on the producer side. Producer side, you have implemented, that's fine. But on consumer side also, we need to implement circuit breaker design pattern so that they can consume the data and return the response as well. And third is you have to implement logging mechanism and you have to monitor the flow like everything is working fine or not if there is if there is any issue is coming then are you logging that error or not those things you have to implement then comes this horizontal and vertical scaling how it works with kafka okay so it's uh, regarding scaling only so how it scaling works vertical horizontal uh, those things we can work upon then comes final question spring boot starter period what is this so it, this question has been asked multiple times too. Okay, in Genpact also it is asked, and this uh, interview also, Wipro interview also it is asked. In EPAM interview also it is asked. So this is very important question. Okay, so with the help of Spring Boot starter parent, it actually uh, it doesn't download the dependencies. You should be very much clear in mind. Spring Boot starter parent doesn't helps in downloading dependencies. Rather, it checks for versioning and configuration. Okay, whether those version and configurations are properly aligned for Java and Maven, those configurations are properly aligned or not. And whatever dependencies you have added into that com.xml file, those are having certain versions, right? So those versions are properly in sync or not. Okay, so it should not be like some dependencies having lower version, some dependencies having higher version, then it will not work, okay? So as per Spring Boot 2 or Spring Boot 3, those versions should be as per the latest Spring Boot or, or the previous Spring Boot version you are using. Based on that, all the dependency versions should be synced, okay? So it actually checks that Spring Boot Startup period. All dependency versions are in sync or not. So this is very much important. And it uh, checks for plugins as well. All plugins are having latest information or not latest versions or not. So plugin information also it checks. So these are, these are the uh, main advantages for Spring Boot Startup period and these are the usage as well.
So I hope you got the clarity. Like there are a lot of questions that has been asked. I like I know like twenty to twenty five question has been asked. So it's like a good set of questions. You can practice it, and then you can keep on revising this. If you are getting any doubt, you can keep coming onto this video and see this video uh, uh, as many times as possible, so that you can get more clarity on this. So if you have any doubt, any question, you can comment it down below, so that you will get the idea, and I will get the idea. Like you are just. learning and understanding implementing things okay so please like share and subscribe and please share it to your friends those who are going to give interviews so we'll see you in the next video with next set of concepts so it's devjit roy signing off bye bye